And we're here today with Dr. Mike McCracken, who is a prosthodontist and a professor at the University of Alabama Birmingham School of Dentistry. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about one of uh, Mike's, uh, one of the things that's near and dear to his heart, because we've been, we've been talking a little bit, and that's the health effects of edentialism. So Mike, why don't you just go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you've been doing, both at the school and, and professionally, along that line. Thanks, Brad. Nice to be here. We have been learning a lot about edentialism in the last 10 years or so and realizing how health can be affected by the oral state and how somebody losing their teeth will lead to all kinds of systemic problems such as atherosclerosis, cancer, people take a lot more GI medicine who have uh, a denture or who have a poor denture and so we're looking at ways that we can treat that as a dental community. I think it's an exciting time to be in dentistry because now we have implants, we have options that we didn't have uh, many years ago that we can offer to patients and instead of saying hey, you have to have a denture we can offer them some valuable alternatives. Okay, and anyway, we were talking earlier and, and one of the, uh, the challenges is as dentists it's, it's our obligation to communicate to our patients what's going on and as far as that, that, that bone loss that occurs so maybe you can just share your thoughts along that line. I think about that sometimes and, and we know that one of the leading uh, lawsuits against dentists is a failure to diagnose periodontal disease. And so a patient, they go to their dentist who they get along well with for 20 years and have been going in every six months for their checkup and uh, doing what they think they should be doing on their side. And then one day the dentist walks in and says, well, I'm sorry, you have periodontal disease. And now you're going to have to lose these teeth or you're going to have to have this surgery or have these implants placed. And, Understandably, the patient is upset by this and they say, well, why didn't you ever tell me about periodontal disease? Why didn't you ever tell me I had this disease in my mouth? And they're upset and this causes some problems. Sometimes I wonder, will we see that with the edentulous patient? Because now we have a similar situation. We have a patient that's been going to a dentist for 20 years. Maybe they come in every year or two for a checkup or a denture adjustment. And then all of a sudden they have problems with a mandibular fracture or they have a situation where they can no longer successfully wear a lower denture or something else related to bone loss and maybe they're going to ask their dentist why didn't you ever tell me about this bone loss why didn't you ever tell me this was going on why didn't you tell me about this disease because now we can effectively treat that with implants okay and then so along that same line then um, part of it I think is a, um, a, a dentist either not involved with implants now, for whatever reason, um, their obligation to offer that as, as, as an option to that patient to, to uh, potentially uh, stop that, that potential bone loss. Absolutely. Uh, clearly, whether you uh, offer those services in your office or you refer to a, a surgeon as an example for implant placement, that has to be uh, offered to the patient. They just need to understand what's going on. And we have some uh, patients that learn the hard way uh, the effects of this bone loss and uh, as an example we had a lady who uh, after being a dentist for many many years her mandible resorbs and resorbs becomes the size of a pencil she breaks her mandible she's walking out to the pool and stepped too hard and hit her jaw and now she has a fracture it's a very difficult revision surgery um, usually bilateral hip grafts and, and uh, quite a bit of hospital um, experience a lot of money a lot of morbidity with that when if somebody had just told her at the right time hey, we need to put some implants in here to, to maintain these bone levels she would have been much better off mm -hmm. and then it's not a hospital procedure it's an in-off procedure right. very simple instead of three days in the hospital you have three hours in the dental chair and are there any studies or any research coming out of at a UAB uh, related to uh, that you're able to maintain that bone law that, that bone level or even in some cases potentially increase and yes, and we did see an increase in bone levels. Uh, surprisingly, surprisingly to me, a uh, study that was done by the uh, periodontist at UAB, this was a, a prospective clinical trial, long term, about eight years, and we restored these patients with five implants in the anterior mandible in a very traditional st Branamark style with about three millimeters between the prosthesis and the edentulous ridge. And we noticed over time, this was back in the 90s, that the tissue would proliferate and, and touch the bottom of the bridge. And the periodontist thought, well, we better clean that up or take that down so the patient can have access to clean. 
when they went in there to remove that soft tissue, it wasn't soft tissue, it was bone. And so we measured that as part of this uh, clinical trial and we see a millimeter and a half, uh, some patients two to three millimeters of bone gain distal to the implants. So not only are we maintaining the, the bone between the implants, we're actually getting a bone maintenance or a bone gain in, on average uh, up to 20 millimeters behind the, the implant. So as we're adding stress back to the system, the, the bone is responding by increasing in volume and density. So maybe that also leads into, I know one of your other uh, primary interests, it, it, talking about patients, to patients about, about bone loss uh, would be, you know, giving them solutions that are affordable. So maybe you can tell, share with us a little bit what, you, what you've done at the school as far as, as uh, low cost options for restoring these patients both in the school and in what you're doing uh, outside of the school. Certainly. I do think that's critically important. If we believe that implants are, are important, as we do as a profession, then, then how can we help more of our patients get into implants? How can we uh, assist our patients, uh, let them uh, experience implant dentistry and uh, enjoy those benefits? So at the school, we have developed a low-cost program that we've offered for our patients. These are, of course, keep in mind, it's a dental school and, and we have uh, students working on these. But we have provided the a two implant overdenture, which is just a basic entry level uh, implant prosthesis. But we give the two implants, the two dentures, and the two attachments for around $1,500. And most people we find uh, can get into that with uh, a little bit of desire. Uh, most patients are very satisfied with that price point, and we're able to help them maintain their bone, help them get rid of a complete denture and move into implant supported prosthesis. Mm -hmm. And I think you'd also mentioned, uh, you've also done, you're doing some ongoing work with that three millimeter diameter implants? We have. And this is uh, an interesting, to me, uh, potential solution to the, some of the costs associated with traditional implant systems are the single piece over denture implants. Um, these are available generally in different sizes around three millimeters or a little smaller. And we wanted to make sure that this modality, treatment modality was going to be successful for our patients. And we did a, a clinical trial about uh, 45 patients and we randomized those to two, three, or four implants in the mandible three millimeter diameter. I was really surprised at the results. I'm generally conservative when it comes to loading protocols and uh, time and so forth. Obviously with a one piece implant you can't have delayed loading. And so we had uh, immediate loading at the time of placement, and we had a relatively small diameter implant, and clinically the results were excellent. I'm gaining much confidence in this treatment modality. Okay, and then um, what I know that the results haven't been published yet, but as far as um, do you have a feeling of uh, preference? Is it two, three, four? Typically, for when you start getting the smaller diameters, or saying four implants in the, in the symphysis, what what was your uh, your take on it? Well, that, that was the main question. Do you have to do four? Because if you're going for a low cost alternative, it would be cheaper to do two. And indeed, we found no difference between uh, two and four implants in terms of uh, implant survival or bone loss around the implants. So two implants in our study worked very well. And uh, the, the, the 3.0, some people even call them hybrids because they're getting close to a conventional diameter mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the very narrow implants, to the true small diameters. Um, would you, would you have a different approach if you went smaller than a 3.0? I've still been a little nervous about the smaller diameter implants. I just haven't had a lot of clinical experience with them myself. Again, coming from a more conventional approach uh, with standard diameter implants. But the results that we got from the 3.0 are encouraging me to try something a little bit more narrow. Uh, there, there are times when that's very helpful. I mean, many patients have a narrow ridge and you're faced with a clinical decision, am I going to remove six or seven millimeters of bone height so I can gain sufficient width for my implant, or am I going to simply place a, a narrow diameter implant, small diameter implant, and I, I think maybe we'll be going more towards the direction of the smaller implants as we move forward with this. Okay, I know what you were talking about, bundling prices so you can uh, uh, get it to an affordable level for patients. You mentioned the 222, where it's two implants, two dentures, and two attachments. Um, now, do you have something else now if you're going to do four 3.0s? Have you gotten into a bundle yet on that, or is that still a work in progress? I was still, for the students, will uh, work in progress for my own practice. I think that's very exciting. 
And I love what Glidewell has done with the package concept because it really simplifies things for me as a clinician to know I mean, this is your cost. These are your implants. You get the overdenture for that, and then I can translate that into a clinical situation with a patient that really wants to get implants, and I really uh, want him to get into implants, and it simplifies things for everybody. So definitely plan to pass those cost savings on to the patients. Okay. And you had mentioned um, um, outside of the dental school, now you're getting involved in a, uh, a community clinic. You want to share a little bit of what, why you got involved with that and what your plans are with it? Sure, we, we set up a community clinic uh, outside of Birmingham, Alabama. We're associated with a, uh, an addiction, drug addiction and recovery program uh, down there, but we're also open for community patients that don't have much access to care. And uh, I have to say it's one of the most rewarding things I do, uh, even being a teacher, which is rewarding in itself, to go help people that don't have other avenues for dental work is extremely exciting. And, a uh, big volunteer effort from a number of organizations down there involved with that, but we're planning on offering them the best dentistry we can, and that's definitely going to include implants. Mm -hmm. And it ties right into the bundling things where you can offer things at a very affordable prices. That's right. We have a lot of edentialist folks in Alabama. Six highest in the states, I believe, is our ranking now, so we have plenty of people uh, needing some implant overdentures. And what did you mention you thought the, the percentage was? Uh, for our seniors age 65 and over, it's over 30 percent now in Alabama that are edentulous. And that's fairly consistent with other states. Mm -hmm. okay. So we've talked a lot about uh, uh, restoring the lower, lower edentulous ridge. What do you typically do in the maxilla? Maxilla is a little more of a challenge. The bone is less dense, of course, and the implants are less predictable in the maxilla. I've always been an advocate of multiple implants tied together be it with a bar, be it with a fixed prosthesis. But lately I've had um, success with individual implants and a cobalt chromium framework uh, to give structure to the prosthesis so that we have some form of cross arch stabilization and some splinting I think that's available from that rigid metal framework. And so in the maxilla now I'm moving more towards four implants with attachments using that metal substructure. Okay, and if you go that route for implants and a cast framework, are you going palletless? Or are you still uh, doing full pallet coverage? Uh, I'd have to say I'm about 50-50 on it. I'll occasionally, I'll take the pallet out. I, th I think that's pushing the limits a little bit. Uh, I, I certainly see that it works in some patients, but I try to talk the patients into a pallet. I think it gives me more comfort than, than anything else. Uh, but that's six an another study coming. That would be a great study, a great study. Six implants, no worries. Okay, very good. Anything else uh, exciting going on at, uh, at the school or with, with yourself personally? I'm real excited about the milled bio temps that are coming out now. They look beautiful. I've always been thrilled with the bio temps, the pricing and the uh, aesthetics, especially long term. It's prosthodontist to have patients in cases for 12, 15 months uh, waiting for grafting or whatever and the bio temps have held up real well for me. So I like the, the milled approach they're taking now. It just seems to be um, a neat technological advancement. Mm -hmm. yeah, everything's going CAD CAM and, 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 and it, it provides a more, more uh, predictable, uh, consistent result. I think it won't be too long where I can just take a scan of the arch. I don't even have to make a cast and you guys can send me a biotemp uh, full arch back. That's coming. And then as far as, let's just step back a minute and talk about um, um, your thoughts on cone beam scanning, on, on using it as a diagnostic tool for those edentulous patients. Do you do it just for diagnostic purposes? Do you head towards, towards guided, guided surgery, when would you use a guide versus doing a flap? For me, I find that a flap is useful in many of my surgical approaches. And that may be because I need to manipulate the soft tissue. I may need uh, grafting in a certain situation. We may need to thicken the soft tissue. Uh, so a ver for a variety of reasons, I find that I'm laying a lot of flaps. For the perfect patient with abundant bone and abundant keratinized tissue, nothing easier than a guided surgery uh, with a, a placement to have the uh, confidence and predictability of, of knowing the anatomy, you can't beat that, um, and, and, and knowing that your implant's going to come out in the right spot. Okay. Are you at the school, are you guys r routinely uh, uh, CAT scanning the, uh, those patients? R routinely, no. It's uh, for me, and where I, in Alabama, where I practice, uh, for me, if the patient has abundant bone, 
uh, don't really need a scan. If the patient has very inadequate bone, sometimes I don't need a scan to tell. I know I need to graft, and, and it's the patients in the middle. Certainly large cases uh, of C CBCT is a great help, uh, but the patients where you really don't know, what's our approach going to be? Do we need to graft? Can we place the implant? Graft simultaneously. Many of these questions are answered with a cone beam scan. And then uh, any other last kind of final thoughts tying things together as far as we talked about uh, the, the health effects of edentialism and keeping patients informed of that. Implants as an option also and particularly implants and prosthetics on top of them as an affordable option. Um, any final thoughts or comments? I think we should be using the fixed prosthesis more. So a lot of people are very comfortable uh, with the two implant overdenture, the four implant overdenture. I think the fixed prosthesis, the traditional Branamark hybrid prosthesis, is one of the best things we can do for folks. I'd love it if we were doing a lot more. Okay, and how many implants do you usually like to do for your, for your hybrids? Uh, I like, traditionally, I like five, but I'm very comfortable with four. They can be straight, they don't have to be tilted. The literature clearly supports four implants in the anterior mandible. And just recently, I read an article that showed good success on three. So maybe we're even um, pushing the limit in that direction as well. But I think four or five implants is, is very reasonable. Okay, great. So, so what do they say in Bama? Uh, a roll tide. There you go. Well, thanks for your time. Pleasure. Thank okay. you.